So, so Gandhi's view is that this is what the transcendentalists have been able to do. They have been able to restore the conscience to its proper dignity. There is a fundamental difference between this essay and Gandhi. And this is where I think we have to see how Gandhi went far beyond what Thoreau had envisioned. Thoreau never envisioned, number one, the idea of collective resistance. What your individual conscience tells you, you must do, you resist the world. But Thoreau is not interested at all in mass organization, in mass resistance. Gandhi has to think of collectivities. He has to think of how he's going to generate a nation and make it mobile, so to speak. It's a fundamental difference. So you have to, then you have to see what is the grammar of Satyagra, as I would call it, right? And that includes going to jail, right? Boycotts, strikes, sit-ins, all of those kinds of things. Thoreau never had that arsenal. I'm using military metaphors deliberately here. Right? He never had that arsenal in mind. That's one fundamental difference. The second fundamental difference is that, that Gandhi actually seriously adopts Christ's view that if you are being oppressed, you must match the, sub, the oppressor's capacity to impose oppression on you. You must match it with your capacity to endure suffering. And you must take the suffering of others upon yourself. I don't think that idea is to be found anywhere in the writings of Henry David Thoreau. Not in this essay, not in Warden, not in any book. Okay? But I also think of Thoreau as an example for a different reason. And the reason is that sometimes we like to think of how things come back to where they started from. One of the interesting things about Thoreau, unlike Ruskin, for example, is that Thoreau, for a person living in Concord, Massachusetts, for a person who never left his native New England, never, the furthest he traveled to was Maine, okay, which is further up north. For a person who never left his native New England, he was probably the most cosmopolitan New Englander of the 19th century. He was deeply steeped in Indian texts, in particular, and Warden, he has a passage where he says, I bathe my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, since whose composition ears of the gods have elapsed, and in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seems puny and trivial. That's an exact quote from Warden. He was deeply steep. He wrote a book called A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. It's A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. It has seven chapters. The Tuesday chapter is entirely devoted to a discussion of Hindu philosophy. Okay. Now, we need not be detained here by the consideration whether he was an Orientalist or not, what his real understanding was. That's, not, again, something that's going to take us far astray. But I think that when we do intellectual history, we have to come to an awareness of these because surely Gandhi is not going to be unmoved by the fact when he's looking at a whole range of writers that there is his man called Thoreau who happens to write a sense of civil disobedience but who also has been fundamentally inspired by Indian texts. Could there be perhaps some way to link up these two things? Right? And this is where the intellectual has to do the task of interpretation and where it obviously becomes interesting. Why Thoreau? Why not somebody else? Right? And so on and so forth. All right, so I'm going to conclude my discussion of this segment by simply saying that one can do a kind of an intellectual interpretation of all of these figures of this kind. But I think if we try to do a mechanical reading, ah, did he read this essay or not? Did it influence him or not? I think it's going to get us almost nowhere at all. You know? And I could give you a very interesting illustration <laughs> of something that has never been mentioned in the literature, you know. Thoreau and Gandhi shared many things in common, other than their vegetarianism. Both of them were great walkers. You know, uh, Thoreau wrote an essay. It's called On Walking. Gandhi walked 10 kilometers every day from the time that he was 22 until the end of his life. 
except when he was seriously ill. Every day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Right? And when he walked, he had Mahadev on one side, that's his one principal secretary. Then he had Kalila. They would take dictation as he walked along because he typically in one day he might answer 80 to 100 letters. Right? I mean, there's a diff discipline of a different order involved in how he led his life. Right? But if you read the essay on walking, and then if you go through the collected works, you find Gandhi referring to the essay every now and then. We don't pick up on that. But it's very important because, after all, if you start looking at Gandhi, what could be more important than his relationship to the body? I mean, there was a man who had the audacity to think that if he decided that he would forego food for a few days, the entire country would start trembling. And it did start trembling. As George Orwell noticed when he wrote a short piece called Reflections of Gandhi shortly after the assassination of Gandhi. I mean, Gandhi was the master of the political fast. The master of the political fast. That is, that is only possible when you have a relationship to your body of a certain kind. Right? And this is where the importance of something like walking comes in. And this is where then Thoreau comes in into the discussion. So we're going to try to untangle his relationship with the West. We're not going to be able to do it simply through a mechanical reading of, ah, did he read this essay? And you know, when did he read it? So on and so forth. Okay. Now let me give you a very different segment of this history, but I want to now look at the other side of the story. What was the West's relationship to Gandhi? Not, you already have been in of that, obviously, but we want to look primarily from this standpoint. And then I will move to my concluding remarks after I finish with this particular segment. And this is Gandhi's encounter, or the West's encounter, or a particular portion of the West's encounter with Gandhi. That is the relationship of African American intellectuals and activists to Gandhi. This story is commonly and entirely erroneously believed to commence and end with Martin Luther King. When you usually hear about what was his relationship, what did African American intellectuals know, very often people begin with Martin Luther King, uh, he was a great follower of Gandhi, and then the story ends there. But the story commences much earlier. Because the black quest <coughs> for a Gandhi started in the early 1920s. And no lesser a figure than W.E.B. Du Bois, the greatest African-American intellectual of his time without a shadow of a doubt, in my view. Okay? He also edited a journal called Crisis. Its subtitle is a beautiful subtitle. Of course, he was very ironical, ironical about it. A Chronicle of the Darker Races, <laughs> it's called. Okay? As early as 1922, W.E.B. Du Bois published an article on Gandhi in this journal which he edited. 1922. And from thereafter until the assassination of Martin Luther King, there is a long story to be told of the African American fascination with Gandhi. But this was not a fascination in the facile way in which we are fascinated by all kinds of things. You know. I mean a serious intellectual engagement. The Atlanta Defender, the Chicago Daily Word, all of these African American journals were full of articles. Now you can write this history in an institutional way, you can write it through the history of several figures. I'm going to mention only two institutions simply to indicate to you the tenor of that interest, and then I'm going to move to a quick discussion of four figures here. Right? The two institutions are CORE, that's the acronym Congress on Racial Equality which was an organization founded to promote African-American interests, and the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Peoples. Both of these organizations were heavily invested in trying to understand how Gandhi's ideas could be used in the American context. So one of the earliest writings that we have in 1923, one of the uh, people who's writing for one of these journals says, watching what's happening in India, that if Gandhi can bring down the British Empire, to non-violent resistance, why can we Africans, Americans, not do this in the deep south? Right? Aren't the conditions of, of oppression 
rather similar. That's what they're thinking, of course. Quite reasonably so, right? So you find this in 1923, and as I said, this would persist for a very long period of time. Beginning in the early 1930s, many patients of African-American intellectuals and activists started to go to India. In 1936, there was a delegation, and Gandhi says something that I think can only be considered prophetic today, you know. Uh, namely, that he told the delegation that came to him, he said, it is quite likely that my methods will be taken up with great success in your country, right, by your people. He's listening to these people, and he comes to the view. The four people that I want to mention very briefly, James Farmer, one of the principal architects of the civil rights movement, lives in the background, frankly, for the most part. Now, of course, these figures are being resuscitated by historians, you know, activists, so on and so forth. A. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King, and from my standpoint, the most interesting of the four, Bayard Rustin, about whom I will say something in a few minutes. Let me just very quickly mention A. Philip Randolph was a labor organizer. The best way to characterize him is that he had the most interesting ideas. He was keeping a very close watch on what was happening in India. He looked at what Gandhi did during the sword march, and he decided that there would be a march to Washington. A march to Washington. But the fundamental difficulty with Randolph is he had great ideas, and he had absolutely no way and no inclination to implement them. He was not a mass organizer, even though he was a labor leader, interestingly enough. But the idea of the march to Washington, which always became part of the African-American imaginary, and you have to recall that finally King did have a march to Washington where he delivered that famous speech, I have a dream, right? This idea goes back to A. Philip Randolph. He first voices it in 1932, after he has seen the sword march in India. Then you have James Farmer, who is an expert organizer, but he's a Quaker, incidentally. He's a Quaker, so the Quakers come back into the narrative here once again. He's a Quaker, but there is a fundamental problem, you know, with the Quaker community when it comes to political action. And the fundamental problem is that they believe very strongly in the idea of consensus. This became a stumbling block, as he found out, okay? It's too long the story, but it became a stumbling block, and so that, that was one reason why Farmer ultimately could not become Martin Luther King, if I may put it this way, all right? But he says in a document, an unpublished document in the archive that I've seen written in 1944, he says that we have to create a non-violent army, Right? Is he thinking again of what Gandhi has done, how he's orchestrated the masses into certain disciplined modes of resistance. We have to create a non-violent army. Farmer says, and then he makes this extraordinary statement, Gandhi is the key for me to unlock the door to the American dream. Now you can pass the sentence at very great length because the fact that he still believes in the American dream, of course, indicates a certain kind of American exceptionalism, right? That there is this American dream. But the fact that he should pick a brown man in India to unlock the key is, I think, also an interesting testament to his ecumenism. Right? And then we finally move, before I get to King, we move to Bayard Rustin. Now, Bayard Rustin is the man who tutored King, particularly with respect to the ideas of non violent resistance. This is now well known. One of the reasons we didn't know that for a very long period of time is because Bayard had certain qualifications, if I may put it this way, which even taken singly would be enough to confine him to the dustbin of American history. If you have all of them together, you have absolutely no chance in America. And what were these qualifications? He was a communist, he was black, he was a draft dodger, he was a Quaker, and on top of all of that, he was gay. <laughs> on top of all of that, for American society at that time, I mean, this man was somebody who could not be anywhere on the horizon. And Rustin 
always worked in the background, knowing fully that, and King knew that, that if Rustin was brought to the fore all the time, that this would greatly diminish the possibilities of King ever being accepted, even among the African American population, much less the white population, okay, in the United States. And there's a beautiful biography that has been written of him in recent years, which looks at this in enormous detail. Of Rustin. But Rustin is the person who orchestrated the march to Washington in 1963. Tudor King, when did King first become familiar with Gandhi? We know the precise moment, in fact, actually. 1949, when he went to hear a sermon given by Mordechai Johnson, who was the president of Howard College, a black college, African American college, still, is still there. Uh, Johnson had gone to India met Gandhi just literally two weeks before his assassination on 30th January 1948. So Johnson comes back, he's the president of Howard College. In 1949, he gives a lecture in Atlanta. King attends that lecture, and King writes, I was absolutely mesmerized, and I immediately went to a bookstore and purchased six books on Gandhi. Rustin says that obviously, King never learned anything about Gandhi from those six books because I had to tutor him in the methods of nonviolent resistance, right? right? And I think he's fundamentally right. We have this from other sources as well, right? So this is a very clear instance of where King is fascinated, but he simply doesn't know what to do at this juncture in 1949, early 1950s with Gandhi, right? He's subsequently going to arrive at the formulation a formulation that I have some difficulties with. I will not be able to expand on those difficulties, but I'm going to tell you what the formulation was. He says, in what is the most famous statement that he's given regarding his relationship with Gandhi and Christ together, he says, I got my method from Gandhi and I learned the spirit of resistance from Christ. Okay? And so I have fundamental difficulties with that formulation, but we leave it there. This is what he himself said about what Gandhi had meant to him. He also is going to state that Gandhi is the first person who lifted the teachings of Christ to the level of his social collective ethic. So he has a different mode of assessment of what Gandhi meant to him, right? Now, I think the story of Gandhi and King is quite well known. I only want to alert you to some of the difficulties now, okay? in being able to draw a straight continuous line, which is what we like to do from, well, there's the road, then comes along Gandhi, and then comes along Martin Luther King, right? And King basically invited Gandhi's ideas, and all his hunky dory, more or less. But I think there's some fundamental problems if we look at the relationship with these two men. And when I say fundamental difficulties, I do not in any way want to mitigate not even remotely, the extent of King's accomplishments. In fact, when I point to these difficulties, I find to difficult, indicate difficulties for interpreters of Gandhi, including myself. And let me tell you what the difficulties are. Gandhi led a life of extraordinary discipline and abstinence. <clears throat> the last 40 years of his life, he slept on the average about three hours a day. I told him he walked 10 kilometers. He never ate after sunset. He would have very small meals, very often made of nuts. One of his friends made this wonderful quip about him, Sarojini Naidu. She said, it costs a lot of money to keep Gandhi in poverty. <laughs> <laughs> and so there, there's this man, highly disciplined life. A complete he told her, took a vow of celibacy, although he loved the company of women the rest of his life. So let us be quite clear that celibacy doesn't mean what it might have meant for some Indian ascetic tradition where you simply banish women because, ah, the minute you see a woman, you know, you're tempted. Right? No, it didn't mean that at all. He was surrounded constantly by women. And not just his own wife that behaves him well. You know, all right? <clears throat> but he took a vow of celibacy at the age of 37, never touched alcohol, tobacco, or meat, except meat very early on in his life, very, very early on, when he imbibed mutton once, and then he said he heard a goat bleating in his stomach all night long. <laughs> okay? King, by contrast, was an absolute glutton 
for food, alcohol, tobacco, and sex. An absolute glut. I'm not interested even remotely in passing any moral judgment on that. You read his biographers, you read Stephen Oates, he tells you that on the last day of his life he made love to two women, neither of them his wife. Okay? And that's what we're talking about. I mean, the man was somebody who, as I said, was a glutton for all of these things. And you have a sharp contrast with Gandhi. And then you might say, well, so what? It just happened to be two different personalities. No, but we have a fundamental problem if you're Gandhi. The fundamental problem is that Gandhi has a very firm view that there is a fundamental relationship between your capacity to offer non-violent resistance to the oppressor and how you treat your body. He is firmly of that view. What and how you treat your body includes what you put in your body, okay, how you treat it. Do you treat it with respect? Do you put it on public display, which he also did? He, incidentally, never at all abided by the distinction between the public and the private. The distinction between the public and the private was crucial, of course, for King. I mean, all the women he went out with, you don't think he advertised that openly, right? right? So there's a fundamental relationship here. And we're saying that this poses the problem of interpretation for, for those who seriously take Gandhi's view. And I'm not going to try to resolve this, but I'm trying to alert you to why these continuities also have discontinuities. This narrative has discontinuous evidence. Now, there are other interesting problems. One interesting problem is that the otherworldly traditions of Christianity were far more important to Gandhi, a non Christian, than they were to King who was, in fact, a Baptist preacher. He is not only a practicing Christian, he is a preacher. He's the Reverend Martin Luther King. Right? So the other worldly traditions were not, in fact, actually important, I'm saying to you, to King, as they were to Gandhi. Right? Let's look at another angle of this whole question. And here now we go beyond King, we go back to the whole history of the African-American engagement. There's a very interesting intellectual problem which I adverted to actually in my talk yesterday, and this is an excellent illustration of a certain kind of a conversation. The question for us is this. Two subordinated groups, Indians in, under colonial rule in India, and African-Americans, two subordinated groups <coughs> entered into a conversation a very extended conversation with each other without the mediation of a dominant culture. <coughs> right? And so therefore we have to think about transnational histories, we have to think about whether we have to rewrite histories of cosmopolitanism, because when we write histories of cosmopolitanism, we almost invariably think that the West has to be into those histories. But where was the West there? It was the other West, if you want to call it that. That, that is perfectly permissible. But these are two highly subordinated groups who entered into a fundamental relationship with each other across a very long distance. And I think that this offers many, many lessons for us to think about if we're interested in the intellectual history of these kinds of issues. Right? And so on. And I, I said one could draw many other distinctions between King and Gandhi and move into many other segments of this particular history, but I only want to give you a little flavor of what is really involved when we start to look at this. And so now let me finally move to my concluding observations. Um, and I don't think I have to really <coughs> spread out the limitations of intercultural dialogue because I've been doing that without using that phrase, you know. What are the ways in which we think about the histories of African-American activists and intellectuals in relationship to the independence movement in India, right? Gandhi's ideas, so forth and so on, right? Or the relationship of Thoreau to Gandhi. Because here again, Thoreau is also a representative of what we might call rugged Yankee individualism. Gandhi was anything but that, right? And so they, they inhabit very different worlds, and yet they're able to enter into what appears to be almost a live conversation, right? right? And so, now, here is where for me the fundamental 
limitations come in. Insofar as the West has been interested in Gandhi, and I would say the interest has been, in fact, actually very partial. That is my own view of the matter. I don't think you can measure this by how many biographies have been written, right? Uh, I don't think you can measure this by the fact that Attenborough made, you know, a roaring success for Gandhi in 1982, right? Or the fact that he might even appear Gandhi in a Doonesbury cartoon or The Simpsons show as a, you know, as some kind of buffoonish character for a minute or two. I don't think we're going to be able to measure it by, by those things. I'm looking at it from the point of view of, well, what is the place of Gandhi in the trajectory of modern Western thought, for example? Hardly any. Even, as I pointed out yesterday, even in post-colonial thought, which you would think would have taken, the practitioners would have taken it far more seriously, hardly any. Right? What has been the Marxist engagement? You think of 50 of the leading Marxist figures in the West, right? How many of them seriously at all engaged with Gandhi? None, frankly. And so on and so forth, right? I don't think that Gandhi really had much of a presence in the West. Insofar as he had a presence, because I don't want to say he didn't have any at all, insofar as he had a presence, it was reduced to the following. The idea of nonviolent resistance as a technique was adopted by various people. Right? And I have to say that in the long run, that is true of Martin Luther King as well. <coughs> it is true of Martin Luther King as well, because nowhere in King's writings do you see, when he adverts to Gandhi, nowhere do you see any invocation of Gandhi's critique of modernity, his critique of industrial civilization. No way. Right? And, you know, there may be reasons for that. It may have to do with traditions of American pragmatism, to which King was deeply wedded in his own way. Right? It may have to do with the fact that, as I said, the other worldly traditions that Gandhi embraced were of not any interest to King at all. It's very interesting that King adopted everything in the arsenal of Gandhian resistance. The sit-in, <clears throat> the strike, flooding the jails. You flood the jails with your people, you know, embarrass the opponent. You get enormous cultural capital if you're from India. Um, if the person also knows, ah, that India is the land of Gandhi, I can't I mean, to count this number of places, and if you say you're from India, and then the person says, ah, the land of Gandhi. It's not the land of Nehru, right? I mean, sometimes you might say, ah, the land of Amitabh Bachchan or Shah Rukh Khan, these are Bollywood superstars. <laughs> right? So it's the combination is now Gandhi or these superstars, Bollywood superstars, right? It's not the land of countless number of saints, Ramana Mish, Mahavishi, Aurobindo, to some outsider, it's the land of Gandhi. Gandhi's name still carries cultural capital. The Indian government exploits that all the time. The government that has completely abandoned any interest in Gandhi, not even an iota of interest in his ideas. They have completely disowned him. Okay? But they hasten to build statues of Gandhi all over the world. The minute they get a request from Bulgaria, please send us a statue, they've got a whole package. Okay? Right. So this is what I mean, cultural capital. You know, it's the Buddha or it's Gandhi or it's Shah Rukh Khan, the Bollywood superstar. Right? Insofar as Gandhi was ever appropriated, it was simply to take up the idea of nonviolent resistance as a technique. And then to mount those usual pieties about Gandhi as a man of peace. We all believe in peace, you know. Only a few lunatics will, you know, overtly say that they're not interested in peace. Right? Right? So forth and so on. You know, everything that's calculated to bring a discussion to any kind of end, all those pieties will be pronounced, right? When the Gandhi's name comes up for discussion. Right? So that's the first fundamental problem. That even Gandhi's view of nonviolent resistance, not as a technique, but as the very being of life, that has never received any recognition in Western thought, for the most part, except and I want to underscore the word accepted, again, except among certain thinkers who were always at the margins. 
I mean, a very good example is E.F. Schumacher. You know, uh, the Greens would all know about it. My book, Certainly Small is Beautiful, right? The book that he became very famous for. Good Work, another extraordinary book that he wrote. Right? Schumacher had an abiding interest. And he was actually an economist. To think of an economist and an interest in Gandhi is like an extraordinary oxymoron. But of course, Schumacher was completely ostracized by the profession, if you know his whole biography. Okay? Once he started writing books such as Small is Beautiful, I mean, they banished him from the profession. They said, this guy's become some kind of lunatic. If you're an economist, you do econometrics, you write up a few formulas, and you think that they explain the whole world. You know, right? <clears throat> so there are exceptions, but fundamentally, nonviolent resistance as a te technique is all that was adopted. Gandhi's critique of the nation state, his critique of modernity, his critique of industrial civilization, none of that received any kind of recognition. Okay? Now, I could go on this, but I think I've gone long enough. I just want to end with one remark. Um, I would have had to truncate my concluding remarks a bit, but I think I've given you enough of a sense of uh, how we might want to tackle this question. My, and my concluding observation is very simply the following. In the 1960s, there's a slogan that became immensely popular, and particularly in the late 1960s when there was a worldwide, or nearly worldwide, student unrest. Right? We all know about that. Uh, demonstrations against the Vietnam War, right? All of that. And that slogan was attributed to Gandhi wrongly, by the way, as you see now. Right? Does anybody recall that slogan? No. Okay, does that slogan, yeah? No. Think globally, act locally. Think globally, act locally. Yeah. Right? That was a slogan. Think globally, act locally. That was Rio. So okay? Was now, I want to suggest to you that if you want to look at Gandhi, think of the very opposite. <clears throat> what he stood for is the exact opposite of that formulation. Okay? By which I mean this. The Gandhi was very committed to, I've already indicated in passing, critique of modernity, critique of industrial civilization, critique of the knowledge systems in which our ideas are embedded, the dominant knowledge systems in which our ideas are embedded. Right? He was firmly of the view that you have to partake of the life of the community, okay? Partake of not simply the life of the community, partake of the ideas of the community. Right? And the community can be viewed not simply as a place that you live, but community has to be fleshed out into a much larger notion. Okay? And my submission to you is that if we're going to think of Gandhi, then we have to really think of the other formulation, and that is you think about yourself as somebody who acts globally. Now the Seattle WTO protests, anti-WTO protests, were largely orchestrated. You know, if you look at the studies that have been done, I mean, this was done largely through cyberspace in the first instance. Okay? That you have to be concerned with what's happening in Zambia or Sudan or wherever else. I mean, it's like George Steiner has this wonderful a uh, statement in one of his books where he says that you, know, you read a, a novel by Dostoevsky and you feel the pain of that character in this Russian novel and you're sitting somewhere in India or England. This character is not even a real character and the novelist is a Russian novelist. You feel the pain of this character and yet you cannot feel the pain of your neighbor next door. Right? And so my submission to you is that we have to move to the different formulation, which is what I think Gandhi really stood for. Think locally, act locally. Thank you.